Overkill is thrash metal royalty. I'm just going to say that because they've been around for basically the entire lifespan of the thrash metal genre. They're one of a couple bands that have been able to do that, whereas other groups have either dropped off or have decided to walk away, Overkill is still going strong nearly 40 years later. And this is a group that has a ton of studio albums, 19 to be exact if you count 2019's The Wings of War. This is a crazy list that we're about to do, but I'm going to try to shoot through it as quickly as possible, that way not to take up too much of your time. How many of these albums are worth checking out? Is there any wrong answer with Overkill? Personally speaking, not really. There are a couple that are kind of just eh and don't lend themselves to memory quite as well. But remember, this is also a subjective list. It's very well possible that an album that I consider to be not that good could be one of your favorites. So I invite you to create your own list in the comments below and share with the class. That being said, I'm going to stop dilly-dallying. It's time to rank them all with Overkill from 19 to 1. Let's do this, baby. Number 19 is from the Underground and Below. This is a disc from the mid-1990s that really has some decent material that's really uh, within it, but it's not one that lends itself too keenly to memory. It's not one that if you heard the songs live, you would necessarily recognize, unless this is one of your favorite albums, of course. And it's not one where whenever you try to snap recall it, it, it does, just doesn't feel like it has that crisp recallability. It's a good disc, but just doesn't have enough to give you a pure memory of it. Number 18 is White Devil Armory, and this is a recent album that does kind of suffer the same fate. The first couple of times you listen to it, you absolutely love it. You are thrashing to it. You see this as another great uh, post-2000s overkill disc. But then whenever you get a little bit of time and space in between yourself and this album, it becomes a little bit harder to go back to it. And whenever you do, you maybe aren't as impressed with it. Or if you're very keen and vibrant and knowledgeable of the overkill discography, you want to instead go to other albums. It's just an unfortunate truth. Number 17 is WFO. This is a early 90s disc that has a lot kind of going for it and it just sort of suffers from the idea that there has to be an album at the bottom part of this list or near the bottom of this list. This is a disc that in the 90s was seen as a bit of a, uh, a trail off or a taper off process from Overkill's 1980s to uh, 1990 output. There were a lot of great albums that really spanned that time, of course whenever thrash metal was hot. And whenever the 90s came, this was a disc that felt like it was able to lean a little bit too heavily on sort of reinventing the wheel a bit, trying to get some groove inserted in there, and it just didn't work as well. Still not a bad disc, but it's down at number 17. Number 16 is The Grinding Wheel, another newer disc that is, again, lending itself to memory in spurts. Again, whenever you have a band that has a ton of albums that, uh, and a ton of albums that also have a lot of great material on them, it can sometimes seem very insulting with when an album that got potentially a very favorable review or was seen as an important part of a year-end list being really low on a list like this. The big reason why this shouldn't cause any sort of anger is that you should know that holy crap, that means that there's 15 albums from this group that I'm going to want to check out over this one. It's one that is actually giving the other 15 a bigger rub. But The Grinding Wheel is still not a bad disc. It's just one that, by comparison to some of the newer Overkill material, is a little bit lackluster. Number 15 is Immortalis, yet another newer album, and one that is able to do a little bit more to lend itself to memory. Overkill had a hot streak in the uh, 2000s going into the 2010s. In fact, we're still somewhat within that hot streak. These are albums that feel like they have a lot to lend and a lot to give, but very similar to other bands that are able to have a big comeback album or a couple of big comeback albums, as we'll see, the ones that are released in their wake or directly after them will sometimes feel like they drop off a bit. Immortalis hasn't necessarily dropped off that much, but it's an album where the thrash just is not quite as potent as some of the other contemporaries we will talk about. Number 14 is The Wings of War, and this album, of course, one of the newest that has dropped, and it has a ton going for it. Though there are some elements of it that I do consider to be a bit hokey. Uh, there are some things that may cause it to actually not reach the hallowed heights of the 2019 album of the year list, which would seem almost like heresy, considering Overkill has always been a fixture. But this is a disc that does show a band that still has the ability to thrash hard, and Bobby's voice is never going to decay. I mean, come on. 
despite what people have said or reported, despite this, despite that, Bobby's always going to have that shrill, he's going to have that scream, he's going to have that ability to just blow our minds with what his voice is capable of. Number 13 is I Hear Black. This is an early 90s disc that does feel like it continues what uh, albums such as The Years of Decay and Taking Over were trying to accomplish, but it is starting to inject a little bit more groove in there. It is starting to become a little bit different. And as a result, this is a very well-tailored disc that just feels like it was missing a little something in order for it to be seen as truly legendary. But it was certainly an album that had its own marking and its own, you know, realized fate whenever it was released. Number 12 is Necroshine. You might as well copy and paste what I said about I Hear Black with Necroshine because this is the exact same deal. These, this, this is a span of albums here where it seems like Overkill was right where they needed to be. However, it was just missing that one little thing to get them over the hump to make them truly feel like heavy metal or thrash metal classics. They're great discs, both of them, and they're able to accomplish a lot and really inject a semblance of groove into the sound of the band. This is also a time whenever they were going through some lineup changes and some differentials, so this can partially be seen as part of the reason why they do have a different tinge to them. But as a result, these two albums are still ones to, to scope out simply because that injection of groove does give it something different. So if you've only listened to hardcore thrash overkill, you're definitely going to want to explore these. You might find something on here that you really, really like. Number 11 is Horoscope. You know, I might as well just copy and paste it for this one, too. These are all from the same era. It's all from right around the same period of time, and they're very middling discs uh, on this list for that reason, because they this is a band that has a lot of legendary classics. And again, it has the same concept going. This one has a little more thrash that's oriented to it. That groove doesn't make as much of a influence here, but it's still a disc that really feels like it has more of the legendary capability of some of the others that we're about to speak about. Number 10 is Under the Influence, one of my favorite Overkill discs, but I can understand why this could be seen as not as high as some of the others that we're going to be talking about. This is a disc that does feel a little bit disjointed, almost as though it was crafted while under the influence. It has great tracks and it definitely shows the era of time in which it was released where thrash metal was king. It definitely has that feel to it, and even whenever you look at the case, it just has all of those dripping pieces of nostalgia that thrash metal fans love. Everything from the very simplistic spine to the way in which we see Overkill's gimmick come forward. Their version of thrash was always a fun version of thrash that didn't take itself overly seriously, and then in other places took itself way too seriously, and it made for a nice balance. Great disc. Number nine is Relics, uh, Relics 14, sorry. Uh, again, there's a great disc that came right before this, one that is pretty legendary, in fact. Uh, but Relics 14 was able to do its own fair share in order to try to amplify itself into true legendary status by its own right. Whenever you have a band that's on a musical plateau that's able to really do a lot of great things, it's able to usually do it again, and that's exactly what happened. Relics 14 continued on what Killbox 13 was able to produce and gave us yet another legendary overkill disc, something that is easy to revisit, and whenever you see some of the stuff played live, damn is it destructive, damn is it awesome, but there's still, you know, eight above it. Number eight is The Killing Kind. Wow. The Killing Kind is another one of those 90s discs, and this one is a little bit later on in the cycle, and it has some cool moments that show that Overkill is about to take a turn. And this is something that causes a little bit of confusion among fans, considering we weren't sure exactly where they were going to go, what was going to happen, what was happening with this band. And as a result, the Curiosity gave us a very different album, one that has a lot of the Overkill qualities that you've come to beloved, but also just felt like there was some trans transformation that was just almost present. It didn't quite get there. It didn't quite get there, but we would get there. This is an awesome album, one that's easy to, you know, one that's easy to go back to, but honestly the reason why it's not higher up on this list is because it sometimes doesn't lend itself to memory. Sometimes you forget about the killing kind, and it is a little difficult to come across. Number seven is Bloodletting, and this was the disc that got me into the band. This was what brought me to the dance. Some might say that this is a little too high. I disagree. Bloodletting was a tremendous album because it did the thrash and groove correctly. Before Overkill decided to turn themselves back into just a thrash metal machine, they were able to release a disc that sounded both destructive, it really was fitting for its name. For its title, Bloodletting is a crushing disc, and one that is able to bring a lot of people on board simply by some of its abilities. 
This is also one that was almost being a John the Baptist to some of the albums that we're about to talk about, simply because it gave us all a feeling that Overkill's turn was now complete and they were about to unleash the wrath. And that's exactly what they were able to do. But before we can talk about that, we have to go all the way back to number six, Feel the Fire. This is one of those debuts that may be, you know, not on top 10 best debut of all time lists, but certainly should be within the consideration or close for an honorable mention. This album showcased what Overkill was able to do as a young, hungry thrash metal band that was full of fury, full of fire, and they made us feel the fire. Rotten to the Core is still one of those songs that is a staple of live extravaganzas with this band. You hear that trademark Bobby Blitz Ellsworth cackle at the beginning of that track, and he still to this day is executing that live. It is an absolutely incredible debut. At times may feel a little bit derivative for the time, but it was still very early in thrash metal's history, so you have to remember that. Whenever this came out back in the 80s, this was seen as phenomenal. This was seen as crazy. But considering there were some other bands that were getting more attention, it was restrictive a little bit more to the underground, which is a damn shame. Number five is The Electric Age. Oh man, of the recent discs, this one is truly electric. It has a ton of riffs. This just does not stop. It is one that pummels the absolute crap out of you and then goes back, you know, sort of like backing the car up just to do it again. It's exactly what this album does. It's more of a recent release and one that has all the capability, not to mention all the magic that some of the overkill legends that we're about to talk about and have already talked about really possess. This is one that just has the feel of an absolute mammoth. Number four is Taking Over. We're going all the way back in time once again to a solid release that is just absolutely spellbinding with its speed at times. This is also one that was very well crafted. The way in which this album flows is tremendous. It makes it a very easy revisitation, a very easy re-listen. And it's one that I've gone back to countless times as a result of this. This is 1980s era overkill at its near best. Number three though, is Killbox 13. Now there was always going to be a time where this band seems to emerge and re-emerge like the phoenix coming from the ashes. And if bloodletting was heralding this re-emergence, Killbox 13 was the execution of that re-emergence. Whenever this album came out, it was immediately recognized and immediately noticed for exactly what it was. This is seen as a downright legendary return to form, the likes of which you only see once in a blue moon, or maybe once or twice a year. But Overkill had already been showing us that this was the capability that they were heading toward. But they executed it with Killbox 13. Every song on this disc is a destroyer. And it's one that got a lot of the modern age metal fans into this group. Well, if it wasn't this album, then it was number two, which is Ironbound. Again, this band didn't need to re-emerge. This band was releasing good albums throughout the remainder of the 2000s. But 2010 was a brand new decade, and a brand new decade needed a brand new Overkill album to make it feel like this band was once again shouting to the high heavens, notice us. And that's what Ironbound did. Ironbound was the disc that really got a lot of the newer metal fans into Overkill. Now I know I just said that about Kill, uh, Killbox 13, but there's about a seven to eight year gap between these albums, which means that there were newer and younger fans that were now, thanks to you know the power of YouTube and other things, able to listen to Overkill and able to get into this band and hear their majesty for the first time, which then sent them on a journey of real you know self-discovery whenever it comes to this band. Ironbound is just a legendary album, one that could easily be seen as one of the best of this decade. Will it be on my best of the decade list? You'll have to stick around to find out. This is an awesome album and one that needs to be consumed. My number one, though, is The Years of Decay. And this is going to be a very like em or hate em pick. The Years of Decay is easily, in my opinion, the most creative uh, overkill album, the one that doesn't exactly sound completely like the others. It's one where they almost sounded like they were trying to maybe try their hand at some technicality or even what some might call progressive music. It's kind of a weird take. 
Well, all it truly is is that the thrash metal evolution that Overkill decided to take with this album was to experiment with some longer cuts, have a little bit more open air, not have it be a complete thrash fest all the time. Sample with groove, but not too much. Sample with spacing and atmosphere and time and just doing some really strange things with this. And it's one that contains some of their longest songs and their longest song to date. It is a unique and curious release, and that is why I absolutely love it, because I feel like this was an experiment that was extremely successful. I also feel like this is an experiment they couldn't do again. You know, you couldn't make this your true philosophy. And that's exactly what didn't, you know, that's exactly what happened. It, it was only done once. And then we immediately got into the 90s material, which was markedly different. If they had tried to do this again, it would have started to feel a little bit hokey, a little bit samey. But something about this album, it always keeps you coming back. Is it because Evil Never Dies? Is it because of, you know, Skull Crusher? Is it because of the title track? Is it because of just the unique way that this album is set up? I don't know. It's one of those explainable, un or, uh, unexplainable ideas that just seems to continuously haunt you. But as a result, you keep on listening to it. And as a result, you realize this is majestic. This is a brilliant album. One that I would consider to be one of the best of all time, simply because of its uniquity. Simply because of what it's able to do. And as a result, it's my number one Overkill album out of the 19 that they have so far given us. But I want to know you guys' list. Are you done with them? Down there in the comments below? I know, 19, that causes a lot of thought. But I hope that you are complete. Either that or you'll stick around in order to post them. I'm very excited to see them. So let me know in the comments below what your lists are. Thank you very much for listening. My name is Cover Killer Nation, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Take care.